I think oftentimes it has been said, oh, a machine can never do that. A machine can never win against chess, chess grandmaster or can never learn Go, the, the game of Go from scratch, or can never talk in natural language. And each time AI and machine learning broke through that ceiling. Uh, I think, on the other hand, it probably um, encouraged many people to extrapolate that essentially AI is all powerful and will do everything, and maybe we can all go home at some point because the AI and machine learning will all do all of that. And uh, a while ago, someone asked me, why don't you just use AI for the FICO score? And I think that brought it home. I, I think there's probably exuberant expectations on how much AI can do, and I basically said, AI alone just doesn't cut it. So I come back to that point later on, but uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce my guest presenter, uh, Rob Jasper. He has a long career in AI, and he will help us understanding the history of AI, taking an outside viewpoint, outside of FICO, and take stock about the uh, possible futures. Rob is an advisor. He is responsible for mis mission alignment at the Pacific Northwestern Laboratory, or PNNL. Previously, Rob held positions as VP of Data Sciences, at compensation analytics provider Payscale, and as the CTO of First Data Analytics Center and CTO of Intelligence Results, a business analytics and model building platform purchased by First Data in 2007. Mr. Jasper holds a BA in economics from Pacific Lutheran University and a Master of Software Engineering from Seattle University, where he taught as an adjunct for several years. My name is Gerald Farner. I work for FICO, joined uh, 27 years ago. My responsibility is um, leading the Advanced Analytics Capabilities Research Group. We work closely with the FICO score development teams and the FICO score innovation lab, responsible for innovation, methodology, and algorithm to help address challenges and opportunities of our clients. So uh, before I go into the content, I just wanted to get a quick read of you, the audience. Uh, could you please raise your hand if you have primarily a business background? Okay, and now please raise your hand if you primarily technical. <laughs> okay, that, that's a good mix. And I think in the, in the spirit of collaboration, we want to make sure that we're all connected. So, without further ado, I want to hand this over to you, Rob. Thank you, Gerald, and thanks to the people at FICO for inviting me here. Um, my career in artificial intelligence began maybe in the early 90s. I was working on analyzing avionics software, safety-critical avionics software, uh, using the programming language LISP and using automated theorem provers to prove properties of those programs. And in the early 90s and prior to that, most of AI was you know, hand-coded systems using programming languages like Lisp and Prolog. And I thought at the time, and I was naive, that I was at the you know, forefront of AI at the beginning of, yeah. of, of, of AI because it was, it was new to me being a computer scientist. I didn't realize that the programming language Lisp that I was using was actually invented before I was born. And uh, the term AI goes back to 55 or 56, depending upon what reference you use. So, so long before I was born as well. So AI has been around for a long time, but it's really evolved and changed over time. So the way I think about AI is, AI is building programs that attempt to solve problems that normally we think of as only being solvable by humans. And embedded in that definition is sort of a moving target. So things that used to be AI back in, let's say, 1960 or 65, like the min-max algorithm for doing you know, uh, uh, checkers and chess and those games, it's now just part of computer science. So the, the target for what we're calling AI is really evolving over time. And then I like to think about AI as this broad bucket of technologies that has been evolving over time. First, manually coding these systems. And then around 1980, I would say, 
uh, machine learning became the dominant form of AI. Obviously, machine learning started before 1980, but more and more people were using machine learning because machine learning was outperforming a lot of the systems that were either manually coded or used rule-based systems, and that became the dominant form. And then after that, with sort of the invention of deep learning and AlexNet in particular, deep learning became the dominant form of machine learning. So, so all of these things are still happening today. People are still hand coding systems in, in languages. There's a new version of Lisp called Clojure. Not a lot of people are using it, I suspect, but that stuff is still going on. And then I, I like to think about uh, various kinds of applications that are AI applications, uh, various kinds of programming languages, and various kinds of algorithms. And so way back in 1960, thereabouts, there was a uh, application called Eliza. And I think you remember this. It was like a, uh, it was a chat GPT for, you know, psychology. And so you would tell it your problems and, uh, but it wasn't very smart. You would ask it things like, well, is necessity the mother of invention? And it would say, how's your mother? So, you know, not quite to the standard of chat GPT, but the concept of a chatbot goes way, way back. And then there were algorithms like K nearest neighbor that used vector spaces. That has not gone away. I mean, KNN, by and large, is not uh, the most popular technique today, but vector databases and vectors and all of that is fundamental to almost everything that's going on in yeah. the deep learning space. I was just thinking Eliza may have hallucinated a little less than ChatGPT. Yeah, I, I would suspect so. <laughs> I would suspect so. I think Eliza was primarily a role-based system too, right? So, and then there was, you know, like I mentioned, the programming language Lisp. A lot of things came out of that. Things like Map and Reduce, like Map Reduce and closures, and a lot of things uh, that we find in modern programming languages go all the way back to there. I guess the other broad trend I would like to talk about is that you know, early AI, the systems where you were manually programming these things and looking at the rules, they were a lot easier to understand why they made the decisions that they made. I mean, there were some challenges with large rule-based systems, but it was a lot easier to tell what was going on. And early machine learning models like decision trees are fairly easy to see what's going on. But as we move forward and use more and more data, the models have become more complex, they become higher dimensionality, and it's become harder and harder to figure out actually what they're doing or to control them in ways, right, that, that would make sense to humans. Yeah. And I, I would add, I think it's also become easier to train a complex machine learning on data that's potentially biased. And then you get a problem, right? Whereas if you used in the old world when AI started, somebody may have built a, a rule system based on domain experience. So in that sense, you're not getting that unknown biases from the data and you don't need to worry about that. But you, you had to worry about the domain experts being a little biased, right? And, Correct. Yeah. Fantastic. So I, I think I want to go back to my statement why I think AI just doesn't cut it, not yet, and maybe not in the foreseeable future. Uh, when we build a FICO score, we think it's all about humans. So we want to help people. And um, a FICO score has many use cases and it affects uh, many people and many different stakeholders and they are at the core of what the FICO score needs to be good at to make the lives of these people better. And that's consumers, that is the lenders, of course, and then the uh, consumer advocates, the regulators, the investors. So these are all real people. And in the same way as to serve these real people, we need to make sure we bring in enough domain expertise that knows about that context into the process of developing a FICO score. So we do use AI machine learning techniques that help us building the FICO score, but there is always the domain expertise is in the driver's seat. Why do we do that? Because the FICO score has a lot more requirements than just maximizing predictive power. And that is the paradigm of machine learning. So we have to care about robustness. Does it hold up over time? When there is data drift, right, uh, in the field, there is always things are a little bit different from the laboratory, 
from the development data. Then the, need, the score needs to be, as you said, eminently explainable, right? We have to explain it to the stakeholders. Um, FICO that did credit risk scoring now for 60 plus years and we learned very early on if we couldn't explain how the score works, it wouldn't be used, it wouldn't be trusted. So explainability means also interpretability, intuition, um, it needs to be plausibly causal um, and then that all together forms what we call credibility. So we need to be, the score needs to be credible that starts with the engineering of the input features, that each of the features need to be easily understandable. Then the relationship between the features and the score needs to be directionally logical and intuitive. So there's all kinds of constraints that come, come up in the model development like monotonicity or some, once in a while something needs to be mountain shaped or U shaped, valley shaped. Um, that's all domain expertise, so we put a lot of guardrails around our nonlinear models that we use for the FICO score. And technically speaking, we use generalized additive models. I see in recent years, they are kind of being reinvented uh, by the AI community in the form of interoperable, inherently interoperable machine learning. And we, I think we have really great experience with this uh, in, uh, constrainable interpretable generalized additive models. If you've been in Ethan Dornhelm's main stage presentation this morning, he talked about the segmentation. So it's adding a lot of sophistication to the ability to capture very nuanced patterns and nonlinear consumer behaviors, but always in a very interoperable way. So I think I, I learned a third grader can do the math to explain why I'm a 720, right? Um, in the development, it's a lot more complex. A third grader couldn't quite do it, but the combination of data guidance and domain expertise can do a great job at it. So there are also these uh, non-negotiable objectives, um, compliance with the regulation, fairness, and privacy. So these are hard constraints on the FICO score. The others, predictive power, explainability, robustness, that all kind of uh, where you would expect trade-offs to materialize. Um, there, there has been a lot of discussion in the, in the explainable AI community that you could build a black box that's more predictive or you could build in the other extreme something simple like a linear model that's easy to explain but you lose a lot of predictive power. So for me the art of good score development is in pushing out the efficient frontier between the predictive and, and explainable to a level where there is not much of a contradiction. And well, yeah. yeah, the way I think about it is if predictive power is your only focus, you, you're actually making trade-offs, but you don't actually know what those trade-offs are, right? Something is happening beneath the covers here and you're making trade-offs, but you don't know what they are. And I think it's important, regardless of what your objectives are, that you shine a light on those factors to see what kinds of trade-offs you're actually making as you develop new and better models. Yes, I, I agree. I, I think the most basic danger is this target leakoff, right? You could have very high predictive power, and I always say if it's so high, <laughs> it, it's too good to be true. Let's see what's the culprit. And we, we do, uh, to understand these trade-offs, we may develop during the course of a FICO score development a few hundred models which use different levels of constraints. We may compare with a benchmark model that may be a stochastic gradient boosting model. And fortunately, what we always find, because we have so much experience with feature engineering and segmentation, that there is not much of a gap between the purely predictive black box and the actual interpretable and credible model in terms of predictive power. But on the plus side, these interoperable models tend to be much more robust because they capture true, relevant, solid drivers of credit risk that are plausibly causally related to credit risk as opposed to capturing spur spurious, potentially spurious correlations that won't hold up over time very well or won't hold up under data drift. I think the last point I want to mention is expeditious. I, I shall give you some examples later, but uh, you can imagine it takes a bit more time to develop a FICO score than 
uh, auto ML, right? <laughs> so I, I think I wanna just share from the history of AI and machine learning, there is this famous landmark paper by Professor Brayman, The Two Cultures, and he, is a he was a statistician, came out of statistics and got very interested in building non-parametric models that are much more flexible than the traditional statistical models to, to uh, kind of adapt to the data. And the more data he got, the bigger the models became. So this was the start of cards and then random forests. And he compares this, this new type, what he calls algorithmic modeling, to the traditional statistical culture. And so we're looking at trade-offs here. Uh, the traditional statistical culture was actually not so much about predictive power. It was all about parameter inference. So you had certain um, parameters in your model, such as, let's say, a coefficient that could be maybe price elasticity or something. So you just wanna put your focus on estimating that coefficient really well, complete with confidence intervals, or prediction intervals. And robustness was important for them, but the predictive power less so. Uh, expeditious was less of an issue, and compliance, fairness, privacy didn't even, you know, that didn't even, doesn't even show up in the textbooks about statistics. And then came this algorithmic modeling culture. I would say um, what we sometimes think of it as modern, but random forests, gradient boosting, it's all now nearing 25 years of age, right? These things yeah. have been invented before 2000. Um, so they were purely focused on prediction, like minimize misclassification error or maximize genie, right? Everything else was kind of, oh, we, we, we check the model later if we can understand it. It's also expeditious. You can do auto ML, hyperparameter optimization to get the model on the push of a button and then push another button and deploy it. The problem with it, it may not be very explainable. It, it, uh, even if you could explain it, it may not make business sense. It may not conform to the domain ex experience. And as such, it may not be compliant. And uh, with that, it may also learn unfair biases. And it may violate privacy concerns. And so as such, um, in the FICO culture, we decided we needed a third culture. And this grew automatically over decades of experience with credit risk score development. Um, we call it the AI, but as, not as in artificial intelligence, but as in augmented intelligence culture. So when I, when I explained uh, to, to the gentleman who asked me, can't you just use AI, I actually said yes, but in the form of augmented intelligence. So augmented intelligence meaning um, experienced model developers and domain expertise sit together using machine learning techniques and AI to find signals in the data, but then having the last word, what really gets into the model and whether it needs to be constrained and how, how it's gonna be used. So that's, the, I think, the augmentation. It's not so much human versus AI, but it's how can humans best benefit from AI, both in the use cases but also in the development of these models. Where I work today, I see a big difference between those two cultures. I work with both statisticians and sort of con traditional computer scientists who have been uh, uh, trained in machine learning. And you know, I'm one of those people, and so I'm kind of criticizing my own group, but they tend to just want to get the data and build the model, where the statisticians spend a lot of time looking at the data trying to verify the data, looking at you know, static analysis of, of various parameters and things before they even get to the model yes. building. And I think that, you know, that's important too, the yes. data prep and understanding the data and how the data may have changed yes. since the last time you built right. the model. It's not just about the model and the predictions. Yes, I agree. I always say don't do lazy modeling. Yeah. Lazy yeah. modeling is just a great algorithm. I push the button, I get the model. That's not the right way. Uh, so, which brings me to this expeditious. So I, I promise you, um, so there is uh, the need to go to market fast, right? When you develop a new score, you don't want to spend a whole year in the lab and then another year for finding data to validate it, but we need to do it really faster. And one of the innovations we've been working on, it's called data sculpting. 
uh, we noticed when we build new types of FICO scores, especially those with alternative data, like in the US, FICO XD and Ultra FICO, lenders can sometimes struggle a little bit to find the right data for backtesting and uh, that's kind of validation and retro analysis. And we can tell the lenders, well, in terms of the industry benchmark data, FICO's consortium data, the score works really well. It has a KS of whatever, 72. And then the lender typically comes back, yeah, but my portfolio, my through the door population is a bit different. And now with data sculpting, we can simply say, just tell us how your through-the-door population is different from the national benchmark. And then we, can, uh, we have a new technique that can reweight the consortium data that we have so that it looks, in terms of the frequency distributions, very similar to the lender distribution. And then we can do analysis of the performance of the score and the KPIs based on the reweighted data which is giving a closer, uh, we think, a closer approximation to how well the score will work for a lender. Um, so we think it's a very promising development. If you want to learn more about that, I would invite you to the FICO Score Innovation Lab, and then we can go into more detail. Mm -hmm.